Hi there, Grant from Penguin Motors here. What you just saw wasn't the most bizarre clutch ever. It's one of the drive plates that we use to connect the uh, engines to the dyno. All I was doing there was just doubly checking it for run out. Normally they go up okay, but uh, I did do one V8 Rover. We had a few thou too many, too much uh, run out on it. And um, yeah, the engine ran, but oh dear, it shook and wobbled and vibrated. and. Um, I had to pull the uh, engine back off the dyno to double check, so it's easier just to make sure they run through before we fit them. So, here we are, mini update. The engine is more or less complete. Um, as you can now see, it's got a head on, it's got a cam in. Um, I'm afraid I can't tell you anything about the head. That's kind of top secret, but uh, yeah. Um, heads on, the cam, the car in it isn't currently new. Um, it's been used before. It's a Newman P5. I used it in another engine. Um, and in this instance, I've just fitted it because it's a known good cam. So it allowed me to put a few running hours on the engine on the dyno, make sure it's all happy before we can start playing with other alternative cams. And we've got a couple. Right, so here we are, round the side of the engine. The more observant amongst you may have noticed we've got a distributor and a trigger wheel and crank trigger. The engine, when it's fitted in the car, actually runs DTA engine management, but for the initial dyno purposes, to make life quick and easy, I'm gonna run it on a distributor and a set of 48 DCOE carbs. Hence, the Weber manifold, not the Gemby one it normally runs. More of that in a second. The main reason is just because it's, it's far easier to uh, get a baseline on carburetors and ignition and get some workable numbers while we work our way through testing camshafts. And we've currently got five. We've got, as installed, a Newman P5, which is actually giving quite a bit more than its specified lift. We've got a Newman P6, a whole bay profile, again, ground by Newman. We've got a Burton BF322, and we've got a Kent RC31. All fairly old profiles, but I think what this engine needs is valve timing. It needs more duration. I know there are some more aggressive profiles in terms of acceleration out there, but unless I think we really need, need one, I don't want to go that route simply because we might, we might find another couple of horsepower, but the faster you open the valves, the more you strain the valve train. And you know, trying to keep the valve train on a Pinto reliable is, is perhaps one of the more difficult parts of running a Pinto. So unless we're forced to go for a, a very radical profile in terms of valve acceleration and lift, I don't want to go there. We'll see. If we don't get anywhere with these five cams, then maybe I will. And on that note, I've not shown you anything to do with timing the cam up, and that is simply because I haven't. I bolted the head on. We've got a cometic gasket underneath it and some standard head bolts. Simply because I don't like the combination of ARPs and multi-layer steel gaskets on these. I, I prefer either a composite gasket and an ARP bolt or, or a multi-layer steel gasket and a standard bolt. Simply because with the um, multi-layer steel gasket, there's nothing to compress, nothing moves. So the huge extra cramping load the ARPs give you does nothing but put a lot more stress into the block. Not everyone would agree, but you know, so far I've not had a failure. So, you know, running standard head bolts and Kometic seems to actually be a more reliable um, set up 
than standard composite gaskets and ARPs. Because we quite regularly go through head gaskets on the dyno and dyno dog always uses the ARP bolts. Anyway, that's not to diss ARP. You know, it's just I think in this combination, the Kometic gasket and the standard bolt, albeit I use early spline type, are the way to go. So, I didn't time the cam up. I literally aimed it at the top dead centre, bolt the head on with valves equal lift on overlap, which is very close to what most things want. Burn on loose, tension belt, tighten it up, and away we go. And the reason I didn't is that, well, when it comes to the dyno, we're going to swing the cam time in anyway. So there's little point in spending ages faffing around trying to dial a camshaft into, you know, a fraction of a degree when we're going to swing the time in anyway and find out what it really wants. I mentioned intake earlier in the video. These are the Jembies and the manifold it normally runs. Unfortunately, due to the change of the head, this manifold is now a terrible fit, so I need to get a new manifold. But the other reason, as I said earlier, right now, we're going to run it on carburetors because it's easy. But there's a secondary factor. Quite often, carburetors will make slightly more top-end power. And the difference is to do with the way the fuel is atomized. With fuel injection, it uses pressure to atomize the fuel. With carburetors, it's, it's the air doing it naturally, so the action of vaporizing the fuel takes heat out the incoming air. It cools the charge. So it actually makes the air going into the engine denser, which is why quite often, engines will make slightly more top-end horsepower on a carburetor than in fuel injection. Now, that's not to say fuel injection doesn't offer many, many advantages, but in this instance, for ease of initial setup, the carburetor wins, and it also, it will give us a back-to-back -back when we do run it on injection. Because if we find there's a significant difference between the carburetor power output and the injected power output, maybe we need to look at injector position or double injecting, running two sets of injectors. My old BMW 2002 picked up 12 pound foot torque by running eight, not four injectors. So, you know, there's, there's a lot to be said for running it on carburetors in the first place. Um, yeah, so other than a couple up some oil line fittings, um, we're pretty much ready for uh, some dynoing. <laughs> 